So what's going on guys, DIY Dan here, and this is another episode of Backroads Arizona. In this video, I'm going to be doing an overview, install, and review of a rugged radio, intercom, and Bluetooth system that I bought for my 2019 Polaris Razor XP4 1000 Turbo Velocity S. So there is a lot of information in this video, guys, and I tried to be as thorough as I could and as fast as I could so I don't waste your guys' time. So let's get to it. So the main reason I bought this system, guys, is to be able to communicate with the rest of the guys that go with me to the dunes. Uh, I found out the first time going to the dunes that communication between your group is a very good thing to have. Uh, I had a near miss at the dunes because I wasn't able to communicate with my other guys in the group that had them. They were talking to each other, said, watch out for this. I couldn't obviously hear that and had a near miss. One other thing that I added was a power switch to turn the Bluetooth and intercom on and off easily. And I'm gonna explain why I did that and show you how I did it. The other thing that I wanted was the ability to listen to music in the Razor, but I didn't want a stereo blasting outside. Plus, if the stereo is blasting on the outside, you're not really gonna be able to hear and use the intercom correctly in the first place. So that's why I went ahead and got the Bluetooth and the intercom. We're gonna go ahead and go over an overview of how the system works really quick. Because if you're like me, I didn't really know much about the system. The guys that I went with said this is the one to get, so that's what I ended up doing. So I did end up purchasing a total of four headsets, two for the front, two for the back. Uh, the two for the back were for my kids because we've had problems with communication in the past. The first time I went to the dunes, I had the kids in the back seat. My youngest started getting car sick. She couldn't tell me. I had the engine revved up, so I couldn't really hear her and she ended up puking in her helmet all over her clothes and the back seat of the Razor. If she would have had a headset, hopefully she would have been able to tell me ahead of time that she needed to puke, and I would have been able to pull over so she could do so outside of the Razor instead of inside. As far as the headsets go, guys, I got the ones that go behind the head, uh, not on top of the head, because that way they work with the helmets, and I ended up getting the rugged radio helmets because these helmets are made to go with these headsets, and it's even a little annoying using them with these headsets. So ones that aren't made to contour around them would be just that much more of a pain. And I did go to ride now with one of the headsets and tried a bunch of half helmets on to see if they would work before ordering the rugged radio set. You are gonna wanna leave the headsets in the helmets while you're using them and put them on as a full assembly. Do not try and put on your headset before putting on your helmet. And keep in mind, at least at Glamis, where I go to the dunes for the most part, it is a requirement to wear a helmet at the dunes. If you do not, you can get a ticket for it. Now, obviously, at the dunes, we have to wear the helmets, but that we go a lot of places where it's more of a scenic ride, and I don't want to wear a helmet. So these are pretty comfortable without the helmet as well. There is a volume adjustment on each headset. So with your headset on and you got the Bluetooth on, listening to some tunes, as soon as you talk into the microphone on your headset, it will shut off the music and you will be able to talk and listen to everybody in the car. That goes for every headset in the vehicle. The only downside to this is, is you can't sing along to the music, otherwise you're going to be listening to yourself quite a bit. Now when you're trying to communicate to other riders, there are PTT buttons, push to talk. And there is one that's on the steering wheel and one on the grab bar on the passenger side. There is not an option for a PTT in the back seat of the car, strictly in the driver's and passenger front. So that's pretty much how this system works. Now let's get to the install. So I removed both of the front seats just to get them out of the way. Then I went ahead and pulled the upper glove box off. Using a tool I bought off of Amazon, I popped the clips off. For the upper glove box, there's two of them. After getting those two clips off, the glove box will pull up without a problem. Then using a T40 Torx, there is a very obnoxious screw that holds the lower glove box to a bracket and you have to get it from the top side. Pain in the ass screw to get to. There was also a little LED light that I had to compress and push out through the bottom. Once I got those two things off, the lower glove box comes out. The bracket that that torque screw came out of, you will need to remove. However, I ended up using it, and I'll go over how and why later in this video. Once you get that out, 
you're ready to install the mounting bracket. Now this mounting bracket will hook in on the bottom and then you have to drill two holes and use two bolts and nuts to hold it on the top side. So I grabbed one of the bolts that came in the kit to do this and got the correct drill bit, set the bracket in place and drilled the holes. It did come with nylon nuts, which was good so they don't vibrate loose. I put these up into place and tightened them down. When you go to drill these holes, make sure nothing is right above where you are drilling so you don't rip out the wiring. You can also put a piece of hose around the drill bit or wrap up a bunch of electrical tape on the drill bit works as well. And that will make it so the drill bit can't penetrate too deep and possibly rip out wiring. So I finished tightening those down and then just made sure it felt secure. Then I went in and pulled out the back seats as well because the battery is located on the driver's side underneath the back seat. And it is highly recommended that you run the power supply and ground directly to the battery to help with interference for the system. After removing the seats, I went ahead and pulled my center console out. There was a Torx screw at the front that I had to get out and then as with everything else on a Razor, they use a lot of these plastic clips. You just have to leverage up the top part of the plastic clip and then the bottom will pull right out. Once getting all the clips out, I went ahead and pulled the front part of the center console up and just pulled it off to the side and then removed the back center console in the same manner. Some of these plastic clips were being a little on the stubborn side, so I actually had to use a screwdriver and leverage it up from both sides. Now, I actually had one of my automotive plastic clip removers that I used as well. However, I still had to use my screwdrivers to get them popped up a little bit so I could get that clip removal tool underneath it. Once getting all those out, I went ahead and pulled the rear center console out to the side as well. So after fighting those clips, and losing a couple, I decided to go ahead and get a kit. And this kit comes with the tool to remove them, which makes that a lot easier. And obviously there was a massive over quantity of these plastic clips, but this kit was only $12, so I didn't really care. Basically, you just push the tool under the top part of the clip, leverage it up. Once it gets to that point right there, you just pull the clip out. So next I went ahead and anchored the antenna so I mounted mine to my roof using a 3 8 drill bit. Don't quote me on that. It's been a while since I actually installed this. And then there is a ground strap that you're gonna to wanna to put on that, especially if you have a plastic roof to give that antenna a good ground. So you'll see this ground is going from the antenna over to my roll cage. So you'll put that ground wire on the antenna before pushing it up into the hole. And then I actually sanded down the powder coating where I bolted it through to make sure it had a good ground to the roll cage as well. A tech screw would have been sufficient. However, I had a bolt to anchor a storage box on top of my roof that I ended up using. Now, being as though I had a metal roof, this wasn't necessary, but I figured it couldn't hurt, so I went ahead and did it. Now we're gonna jump back up top and go ahead and put the nut on the top of the antenna and tighten that down. I just used a crescent wrench to do this. So you do have to assemble your antenna, and that's just a matter of putting the antenna down in the housing. There's two Allen screws that will tighten it down. So Rugged Radio does suggest cutting the antenna to a different length depending on what frequency you're using. They sent it at a general length and I figured I'd try it before doing any modifications to it to see how it works. So this antenna just needs to be snugged down by hand so you can remove it and put it back on so it fits in your toy hauler, trailer, etc which is why I positioned it close to a side so I wouldn't have to climb up on the razor to put it on and off. So this antenna cable comes pretty long and it also has the ends on it already because I really wanted to run it through my roll cage tube instead of on the outside to give it a much cleaner look, but I did not have the crimping tools to do that. And they also say never to do any tight loops with this antenna cable and also to keep it away from all other wiring if possible. So I ran it on my passenger side roll cage and since this cable was so long, I did have to loop it. So I ran it towards the center of my roll cage and then back, but I kept that loop as wide as possible. Then I ran it down along the passenger side roll cage tube. I did a small modification to the upper dash panel on the passenger side so I could run the cable in cleanly. I had to remove one Torx screw out of this panel so I could get to it. Using this deburring bit, 
I ground out a half moon shape in the panel, ran that cable through it, and then went ahead and put that torque screw back into place. So I do have a couple wires from my cornering lights that are running pretty close to that antenna cable. I did the best I could with this installation with not having that happen, but I didn't see any way around this one. But I will do an update video if I notice a performance change with the lights on or off while I'm using the radio. And now we're going to start putting together the intercom and the Bluetooth. I slid the intercom into place and attached the two mounting screws that held that in the bracket and tightened those down. Then slid the Bluetooth in. Attaching the Bluetooth ended up making me have a brain fart for some reason. You're going to want to put the bolts and nuts together before sliding the Bluetooth into place and then tighten those down. I tried doing it after installing the Bluetooth at first and trust me that doesn't work too well. It made me feel really stupid when it was all said and done. And now it's time to start hooking everything up to your Bluetooth and intercom. I went ahead and hooked up the coax first from the antenna and snugged that down. Then I started running all my other cables. So there will be a power and ground harness attached to your intercom. But with the kit, since I got the Bluetooth, it had an adapter. So it plugs into the Bluetooth and the intercom and it's extra long set of battery cables. Plus this kit came with an active filter to help suppress some of the noise generated by the charging system of your Razor. It's pretty self-explanatory on how all that plugs in. Then you're going to reconnect the power and ground that came with the intercom to the active filter. This is one quality concern I had about this kit. When I went to plug the main power harness back into the active filter, it pushed one of the spade connectors out and was making a very poor connection. So I did realize it. And then if you'll notice here, I'm able to pull this wire out. You're supposed to have to push in a little tab on the other side of the connector in order to get these out. So right here, you'll see me spreading that tab back out so I can plug it back in and lock it into place. This actually happened and I had to be very careful putting this connector back into place so it wouldn't happen again. As I went to put this back together, I was being very careful to see why it happened the first time. And the male spade was kind of bent at a bad angle so it was hitting the plastic instead of sliding into the female spade. So using a small flathead screwdriver, I bent the spade back so it would line up correctly. Once plugging it back in, I gave it a good hard tug on each wire to make sure none of those came loose or came out of the connector. Then I started hooking the rest of the cables up to go to the headsets, to the PTTs, etc. So all of these were labeled pretty good in the instructions. They are color coded and they are labeled on the back. So it is pretty self-explanatory. There is a little spring loaded clip that you just pull back on the cables as you plug them in. Now the front two headsets, you have to be careful and make sure that you do put the cables correctly. One's for the PTT, one is for the headset. And you need to make sure they are correct side to side as well. If you do end up getting the ones for the back, they do not matter side to side because they are strictly headsets with no PTT. There is also one more of those connections to connect the intercom to the Bluetooth. There is a ground wire that you need to attach to the intercom and to the Bluetooth. And it also goes to the active filter. On the intercom, I used one of the bolts that was holding where the coax plugs in for the antenna. And on the Bluetooth, I used one of the back cover bolts to secure the ground to that. So basically, I ran the ground from the active filter to the Bluetooth, and then ran a second ground wire from the Bluetooth to the intercom. So after getting everything hooked up to the back of the intercom and Bluetooth, I went ahead and put all my cables through the console and then slid it into place. There is a massive amount of cables and wiring to the back of this thing. You can only do so much to keep it as clean as possible. So right now I've got the deck in place and I've just got everything kind of ran to where it's going to end up after final install. And now I'm going to start running the battery cables back through the center console. So I ended up pulling the shifter bracket and shifter up out of the way as well so I could run these battery cables the way I wanted to. 
and there was just a couple more Torx bolts that were holding that in place. So I got my battery cables ran the way I wanted and then went ahead and placed the shifter back into position and tightened it down. On the battery, black is ground, red is positive, and you'll just loosen off the battery clamp nuts and put the cables on and tighten them back down. Once I got the battery cables ran, I went ahead and installed my center console. Before doing that, I ground out a hole for the battery cables to run through, as you can see in the picture here. I uh, didn't get a video of me putting the center console back in place, but that's pretty self-explanatory as well. So one of my biggest dilemmas for this install was trying to figure out where to run these cables so they wouldn't be next to other wiring, would be easy to plug the headsets in and out of. I ended up unplugging them off the back of the intercom again so I could run them through this rubber grommet. I drilled a hole in the firewall and then ran them back through that hole, put the grommet into place, and hooked them back up to the intercom. Then I ran them underneath, under the driver's door, and then back up under the seat, back into the cab, and then by the center console. Now the reason I didn't go in the center console is because they said to keep those cables away from your power supplies and other wiring as much as possible. And my main power leads going to the battery were in the center console, so I didn't want to have them right next to that. So it is a little bit of a pain to run these cables under the door like this. I actually used a metal coat hanger and bent it, pushed it through, then zip tied the cables to the coat hanger and pulled them through that way. Could also maybe use some tie wire or something like that. I ended up drilling two small holes on each side of the center console and using a zip tie held the cables in place to make them easy to plug in and out of the headsets. Now those cables are still kind of ran next to your positive and negative, but at least you have a plastic barrier between them and they are still a couple inches away. This was by far the most frustrating part of the install of this rugged radio system for me, trying to figure out where I wanted to run these cables, how I was gonna keep them away from other cables, etc. But I am pretty happy with the end result. They do make extension cables for the rear headsets if you need them depending on where you end up mounting your cables to plug in your headsets. They do make a couple other mounting options for your cable ends. They make a flush mount, one that'll go to a roll cage, etc. I just didn't feel like spending the extra $100 to get those extra accessories, and I'm pretty happy with my end result. Once I got those all held in place, I just used some zip ties to hold the cables to the seat brackets under the driver's seat. After that, all that was left to do was anchoring the push to talk buttons. So here is the passenger side PTT push to talk. And I've got it Velcroed around the handle and then zip tied. And I did grind out a little bit of the plastic so that it would not get pinched. And then here is a view of the driver's side PTT and how I've got that zip tied and attached. And then I've got it zip tied around the steering column and ran in the dash that way. So I added an on off switch to my rugged radio. And the reason I did this is because the Bluetooth power button is also the volume button. And I didn't want to have to keep resetting the volume to where I wanted it. So now I can leave it set to the volume I like and just turn the power on and off with the switch. The other reason this comes into handy is because every time you go away from your razor, if you're using your phone for the Bluetooth, it will disconnect. And in order to reconnect the Bluetooth, you have to cycle the power on and off. So I'm gonna show you a quick overview of how I ran that power switch. So right here, this is the main positive coming from the battery and it was going to this pigtail but instead I cut that wire ran this positive wire up to my power switch and then from my power switch I came back down and put it to this wire going back to the Bluetooth and intercom so here's the ground from the active filter that is ran up to the Bluetooth and then from the Bluetooth up to the intercom I used a couple of screws going through the firewall to hold the active filter. 
Once again, you want to make sure you don't have any wiring or anything that you shouldn't be drilling into behind it before mounting that active filter to the firewall. Once I verified everything was working correctly, I went ahead and put the four Allen bolts that hold the intercom and Bluetooth to the mounting bracket. One other thing I didn't like is the intercom and the Bluetooth are pretty heavy. You'll notice how much this dash is wiggling. So what I ended up doing to correct this problem is the bracket that I took that annoying Torx bolt out of that was helped supporting the glove box, I put it back in. So I bent that bracket at a 90 degree right above the intercom. Then using a big zip tie and a foam pad that stuck to the intercom for vibration, I zip tied around just the intercom to that bracket to help support it. That tightened it up quite a bit. Here you can see the difference. I'm gonna shake it again. And it does wiggle a little bit, but it definitely feels stronger than what it was before I did it. Now, whether that dash would have ever had a problem, who knows, but I feel better about it now that I put that little bit of a support bracket on it. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video and it gave you some good information. If so, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I'd really appreciate it. My channel is loaded with a variety of DIYs, all with the same concept. Help save you guys money by doing it yourselves without wasting your time. Hope to see you next time. Have a good one. Later.